Uh, kia ora tātou katoa. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tunga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai. E hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei, mauri ora. Uh, kia ora tātou and welcome to this evening's webinar for the Waiheke Collective Festival 2021. Uh, we are really excited to have uh, Rachel Fuster with us this evening to be sharing about rat genetics. Um, this year, our festival has shifted online and we are into our second week and we have two more webinars after this um, that we're also hoping that you'll be able to, uh, to join us for. Uh, the, the next webinar after this one, just in case you're wondering, is on Thursday the 4th of November and that will be Saving Our Iconic Trees. And then we will be finishing with our final webinar on Thursday the 11th of November. And the COPA before that will be Easily Accessible Digital Tools for Community Conservation. Uh, so just coming back to our webinar this evening, um, we'll be hearing from from our uh, guest uh, very shortly. Um, and she will uh, have an opportunity to introduce herself. But before she does that, um, I'd just like to, yeah, just say a big mahi to you, Rachel, for joining us. Uh, uh, Rachel is a statistical ecologist and she is a professor of statistics at the University of Auckland. Um, I was able to check out some of her work online today, which um, is, I'm just really excited for this opportunity um, that is being presented to us. And also a big mahi to Te Korowai o Waiheke, um, here on Waiheke, who um, have done a lot to, to pull this event together as well. Um, and uh, alongside me here is Lisa Waldner, who's a co-coordinator of the Waiheke Collective. Um, and my name's Bianca Rance, and I'm the other um, co-coordinator. Um, Lisa's just going to run through a couple of things, um, just in terms of questions from our watchers this evening. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Lisa. Kia ora. Kia ora. Hi to everybody this evening. And um, lovely to see we've got um, a good number of participants along today. Um, I just wanted to point out that there is a Q&A um, little button down the bottom of your Zoom screen. Sometimes it only appears when you hover down the bottom with your mouse. If you could post any questions that you have while Rachel's talking in the chat, then we can ask them for you in the Q&A um, session that's at the end of, of, her, um, of her talk. Um, also, if there's anybody on the call who is interested in joining the Waiheke Collective, it's open to all participants. We're a conservation network that works on, with participatory principles. And um, we'd love to have um, any of you come along to our monthly meetings or catch up on our newsletters. You can uh, email us on wahikicollective at gmail.com or you can check out our webpage, which is um, wahikicollective.org. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to Rachel's talk this evening. Really excited to hear more about these little curly rats. So, <laughs> Kia ora Lisa. Kia ora Rachel. There you are. Yeah. You weren't just sitting incredibly still. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for coming That's everybody. Good. Yeah, it's just fantastic to, to have you here with us. Not on the island, but just incredible that we're able to still go ahead with this um, over Zoom, obviously. Um, so yeah, welcome to the festival. And um, we're really excited to to hear about your mahi, to hear about the work that you're doing. And because of all of the efforts that have been going on on Waiheke and the amazing work that's being done by community organizations, Te Korowai or Waiheke and many others, individuals um, on predator control, we are really starting to see the benefits here on Waiheke quite noticeably in terms of um, the, 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 number, you know, the number of birds and, and, and how um, healthy and well our wildlife is. Um, is yeah, it's, it's quite noticeable. So. Um, because of that, we have um, learnt a little bit about rats, um, but certainly not to the level that I'm sure you're going to explain and share with us this evening. So, um, he mahi nui tēnei kia koe, um, and um, we welcome you to, to, um, 
to this webinar this evening and um, we're going to hand it over to you for your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. The um, screen sharing okay? Yes, that great. looks great. Great, thank you. And I'll just try and make sure that my meeting controls don't get in the way. Okay, Kira, everybody, and uh, thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, it's a shame, I know, that we, we can't be together in person. Um, I was so looking forward to a trip to Waiheke, which I haven't uh, been to the island for quite some time now. Uh, but I gather that uh, in any case, the forest is getting a lovely drink this evening and um, I'm sure it will thrive on all that lovely water. So it definitely sounds like it's a, a night to be staying in. And uh, uh, well, what better than to talk about uh, rat DNA and um, statistics uh, instead. So where did you get that rat? Uh, the clues in the DNA, this is uh, what the talk is about. And um, as Bianca said, I am, um, I'm actually a statistician at the University of Auckland, but I spend my statistics um, uh, studying wildlife populations and uh, conservation applications. So I'm very much, I have a foot in both camps and um, I absolutely love our native forest here in New Zealand. And so I, I um, live and breathe my work and my hobby at the same time. I also uh, run the software project called Catch IT, which is for community conservation projects to record their uh, rats and stoat and um, other predator catches uh, through their trapping and baiting uh, efforts, which means that I get a lot of interesting data, what more could a statistician want, I get data from all over the country and um, we're always happy to take on new projects as well if anybody needs a database for storing their data. So some of the data that I'm going to talk about tonight does come from uh, Catch IT users. So it all starts here, that New Zealand has no native land mammals. It's got a couple of species of bats, um, but uh, uh, bats don't quite qualify as land mammals. It's not, it's not got anything naturally that runs around with four feet on the forest floor with sharp teeth and claws or can climb trees and uh, get fish, uh, birds, eggs and nestlings out of their nests. So our unique and wonderful wildlife all uh, evolved over millennia right here at the end of the world in an absolutely uh, pristine, uh, safe environment where they became different from anything anywhere else in the world. And we're so fortunate to have this natural heritage, but of course it comes with a huge responsibility that we've got to protect it. And unfortunately, humans have um, uh, not understood over um, hundreds of years, we've not understood the importance of leaving the uh, natural wildlife the way it developed. And now we've got a huge job on our hands to undo the damage and restore uh, what we can to its former state. So of course, this is the sort of, um, a bird that we would love to see more of in our forests. Uh, this is the Tieke or a saddleback. And uh, it's not far from you. If you're tuning in from Waiheke, there are uh, thriving uh, Tieke on Rotorua, I believe, perhaps even elsewhere in the Hauraki Gulf as well. And uh, my word, what would it be like if we could be walking in mainland forest even in our lifetimes and just come upon a tiake as casually as we do a uh, piwaka waka or a uh, mirror mirror. So that's why we're working towards. But we've got a big problem to get through before we get there and uh, that is to eliminate the predators that uh, these uh, spe species just really can't coexist with, uh, certainly not happily. And I'm going to spend a lot of today talking about rats, and I'll also talk a little bit about stoats as well. So what's actually the problem with 
threats? Why don't we want them here in our native forests? Well, I think, I mean, of course, I'm not the um, expert here. There are people on this uh, call who are far more expert than I am in matters of ecology and conservation. But from what I've learned over the years, it seems like the biggest problem is the way they destroy the natural forest processes. So they eat seeds, they eat berries, they eat leaves even, and they stop the trees from regenerating in the way that they should. Now, of course, that also means that um, they eat things that are natives. Uh, native uh, birds, insects and lizards would like to eat instead. And uh, that means that they're in direct competition for the foods that our natives need to eat. And I guess we could actually just spare a thought about how that is, uh, what, that, what that's like. We've encountered something a bit like that with the COVID um, panic shopping, something that maybe we've never really seen before. When you go to the supermarket and the shelves are actually just empty, and then the next week they're still empty. And after a couple of weeks, they're still empty of the things that you want to buy. You can imagine the, the panic that we would experience if we were in that situation. And really that's what's playing out in our native forests um, day in, day out, and has been for um, decades. And of course, uh, rats also directly eat the uh, chicks and eggs, and sometimes even um, uh, actually adult birds. Uh, so they've got a big problem uh, as uh, predators too. So put those three things together, and that makes them vandals, thieves, and murderers. And I think you can't really get a whole lot worse than that. Here is a picture of a ship rat, and it's rubbing the nest of a piwakwaka, a native fantail. Uh, so just to show how they can, they're expert climbers, and they can just go into the trees, put, um, uh, dig inside the nest, and take out the eggs and tricks. show you a story. This uh, story comes from Catch IT data and it comes from a Kaipupu sanctuary, uh, which is in Picton in the Marlborough Sands. So uh, those of you who've been to the South Island by ferry will know uh, that the ferry comes in just here. So Picton's just off the screen in there. And then they've got all these beautiful headlands um, and the picture doesn't quite show uh, it in its full glory. It's actually steep forested country there. There's a timber yard just um, here. And like so many places uh, that don't have the benefit of being islands, they have built a predator fence to stop the rats. The idea being that they can clear um, this part of the headland of all predators and then build the fence to stop anything from getting back and make it into a um, thriving conservation sanctuary. And so indeed they did this and the predator fences are a lot more uh, sophisticated than what I've shown here. Uh, these predator fences, they go down deep because rats can burrow, they go up high because rats can climb, they have to have overhangs and all sorts of devices to make sure that rats can't readily get in. Uh, but having done all of that and having cleared the rats at, uh, from inside the headland, what I'm going to show you is what happens next. So um, to begin with, we're very happy. Uh, the rats are uh, gone, but unfortunately rats can swim. And we're going to see a lot about that today, which means that despite the sophisticated fence, the rats can get right back in again, just by going the wet way. And here's a picture of uh, rats swimming. Uh, some species of rats, uh, these, this one's a Norway rat, is a very eager, capable swimmer, but so are uh, ship rats, that are the other species that we're talking about. And so what I'm going to show you is what happens next. So this is a little movie, and each of these little dots is a, a rat trap, a snap, snap trap. And uh, you can see the, the whole um, extent of the sanctuary, that's about two kilometers and that's about one kilometer 
there. So it's quite a small place, uh, but they've got, oh, I think it was about 600 traps in there. And you'll see the date goes along the top here. And we're going to pick up in uh, late 2014 when all of the rats are gone. And then we're going to see what happens next. So here we go. And the date's changing, but nothing's happening yet. But now into 2015, we start seeing the first rats and they appear, but they're all appearing around the coast because that's how they're getting in. They're getting in through uh, the sea approach. But by 2016, you've got more of them pushing inland. Uh, they're getting past those initial defenses around the coast. And by the time you get to 2017, really you've got a population back there again. And it's a pretty sad story because all that work that was done to remove the rats in the first place was undone again in the space of about two years. So um, over the space of two years, about 600 rats, over 600 rats were caught in that one kilometre by two kilometres area, starting from none. And um, that just shows the sort of intensity of um, reinvasion pressure that we get when we uh, clear rats away from these sanctuaries. So what I've hoped to demonstrate up till now is that keeping rats and mice away from sanctuary islands is a problem. And part of the problem is that rats can swim. And part of the problem is that they can jump onto boats and uh, ride to places uh, by boat. And we're going to see examples of both of those things happening through tonight's presentation. I'm actually going to tell you a little story from the Bay of Islands about the rats and boats. So uh, you can see this, uh, this part of the Bay of Islands, it's the actual islands in the bay. So it's tucked away um, north and uh, east of Russell. There's a collection of about seven islands called Epipiri, and uh, this is one of them. They've got these beautiful, easy um, beaches and calm seas and so on. Around about uh, 2008 or 2009, these islands were eradicated of rats and other predators. And Doc and uh, the local iwi and uh, guardians associations have uh, managed to keep them largely rat free ever since. But every year rats do tend to get back somehow or other. And then it's just a question of managing to um, catch them before they establish the breeding population again. So this man is called Andrew Blanchard and he's uh, from the Department of Conservation. And it's basically his full-time job to keep rats off these islands. So one of the things that he spends a lot of time doing in summer is standing on the beach and talking to the campers and the boaties that are um, there for recreation and telling them, you must make sure that you don't have any rats in your gear or on your boat and what to do about it. If they do find a rat, don't just chuck it in the sea because it's going to uh, come right back onto the island. So um, here he is, he's talking to the campers on the beach and uh, gives, gives his uh, talk. And you'll notice that he's got his back to the sea. And just as he finishes his talk, one of the campers says to him, uh, well, you see that boat out there? While you were talking, a rat just ran down the mooring lines, jumped into the sea, swam onto the beach and ran underneath one of these boats upturned here. And this is the guy whose job it is to keep rats off this island. And no way did that really happen. Surely that's not true. But what they did, of course, was they um, took a few precautions, uh, circled the boat and up, uh, upturned it. And sure enough, there was the rat exactly as reported. So I think this is such an extraordinary thing to happen that uh, it deserves a diagram. I'm a scientist, so I like uh, plotting diagrams. So here's a diagram of what's happened. He's standing on the beach, he's talking to the campers and they're all listening attent attentively although some of them, their gaze might be drifting out to see a little bit. And 
this rat appears on the boat, jumps into the sea, runs up the beach, underneath the boat, and disappears. All while that, uh, all while he's talking, and his back is turned. It's the most extraordinary thing. So hopefully by now I've uh, convinced you that rats are an incredibly uh, persistent problem, and we actually we, we, we need uh, constant vigilance to keep them away from our sanctuary islands. The uh, experience of Kaikupu, where they had this headland protected by a fence, just shows how important the islands are in this whole uh, conservation ecosystem, because you've got at least a better chance of keeping rats away from islands than you have from keeping rats away from just a headland where they can swim just a few meters and get around the fence. So, Focusing on islands for the moment, which of course is um, a role that uh, Waiheke has to, pl to play. When you have cleared rats off an island, you've gone to enormous expense and um, public buy-in and um, huge amount of effort to do that. And then sometime into the future, almost certainly you will find a rat appear on that island again. And the very first question you are going to ask is, where on earth did it come from? And this is the question that uh, we can actually answer as statisticians. Uh, we can use a, um, genetics clues in the DNA to find out where those rats came from. And uh, once you actually know where it came from, then you know what problem you've got to address. So it's not like it's just an idle, uh, a piece of idle curiosity. Oh, I wonder where that rat came from. It's not that, it's a burning desire, a burning need to know where did this rat come from so that I can address the problem and stop it from happening again in the future. So, I'll give you an example of how this works. Um, we'll take a trip uh, much further out in the Hauraki Gulf to Aotea or Great Barrier Island. And uh, Great Barrier Island also has some um, outlying islands, uh, such as these ones, the Broken Islands. And these islands are um, excellent conservation um, potential because and I hope I'll get this right. I believe they have that they're very, very um, important seabird islands. And rats are very bad for seabirds because they run along cliff tops and steal eggs out of seabird nests. Um, they have um, an important uh, type of grass, I believe, seagrass that's not found elsewhere. Uh, or many other places, and an uh, important snail, I believe, as well. And you can imagine that rats are really not welcome on these islands because of both the seabirds. Rats eat snails, rats eat grass seed. So um, all in all, if we could clear the rats off and keep them off, we're going to make a big win for conservation in this place. So this is the typical pattern, and we see this playing out all over New Zealand um, every year. Uh, at great time and expense, the uh, little islands, the broken islands, were eradicated of rats in June 2009. One year later, rats are back. And the question is, what happened? Did that eradication attempt fail? In which case the rats have been there all the time and they've just evaded detection until the population got bigger again? or did the eradication succeed and these rats have swum back from the main island where they're still uh, extant? So that's the question that we want to answer. And the way that we answer this question is using genetics to find out which of those two scenarios is actually uh, the right one. So how does genetics actually work? And you might actually find it a bit strange to think that we can use genetics to tell the difference 
between rats that are rat populations that are just a few hundred meters apart from each other. But it turns out we can. It's quite, um, it, it's, it's a really powerful tool, quite amazingly powerful. So how does it work? Well, separated populations develop different genetic characteristics. And this is a very familiar idea to us all. So for example, we're very used to human populations looking different according to where they come from. So people in Germany, for example, tend to look a little bit different from people in Italy. And it's not all encompassing. You can't tell the difference every time. But it's just on the balance of probabilities. If you were asked to, if you were told that one of these two gentlemen came from Germany and the other one came from Italy, and you were asked to guess which was which, I think nearly all of you would get it right. This person has um, uh, physical characteristics, in other words, genes that are very characteristic of Germans. And this person has genes that are very characteristic of Italians. So we are actually doing this process, the same scientific process in our heads all the time when we see a new person and we, we typically make a guess about where that person might have come from, uh, what country that person might have come from. That's what we're doing. So um, just to uh, zone in on one particular genetic trait, um, I'm going to use eye colour, not because it's uh, the best one in terms of the science for making the point that I'm trying to make. It's just that it's very familiar to us. And so you can see the point on which the science is based. So here are just two um, charts. And I completely made up the starter. I have no idea what the true frequencies are of blue eyes, brown eyes and green eyes in Germany and Italy. But you get the idea that the point is that in Germany, blue eyes are very common and brown and green eyes are moderate, but less common. Whereas in Italy, blue eyes are less common and brown eyes are a lot more common. So it's not that they have actually different genes in these places. What it is, is that the genes have differences in how common they are. So what we get along this, um, uh, uh, the horizontal direction, you can think of these as different eye colors or just any genetic traits. You could think of the different genetic traits that we as individuals might have. And then, uh, oops, then going up the side, well, it's what I as a statistician would call probabilities. So what we're saying is that in Germany, people have a high chance or a high probability of having blue eyes. Whereas in Italy, people have a high chance of having brown eyes. And it might not seem like much, but this um, recasting the whole uh, framework in terms of probabilities is what enables us to actually quantify how likely any individual is to have come from the different populations. And that's how we can put the whole thing into a firm scientific framework. So going back to our tier, Great Barrier Island, and these uh, small islands outlying the Bro Broken Islands, our scenario is that an eradication was attempted. One year later, in 2010, the rats are back. And there are really only two things that could have happened, uh, the only two things that could have gone wrong. One is that the eradication failed and we're seeing survivors. The other is that the eradication succeeded, but we've got now reinvaders, uh, probably by swimming, in fact, from the main island. Uh, I should say that these are shipwrecks, uh, the species here. So this is what the uh, terrain looks like from the air, and uh, this is the main Artea uh, Great Barrier Island here, and it's just 300 metres crossing, which is about the length of two rugby pitches. So it's not a big distance. On the other hand, it's a fairly cliffy crossing, and although a rat would not actually have a lot of difficulty in climbing this cliff, 
I think the cliffs are nonetheless very relevant because a cliff might mean that a rat is less interested in making the swim across to the island. So what are the things that might attract a rat to make a swim? Um, almost certainly scent, the scent of some uh, delicious food washed up on the beach, a dead penguin or a seagull or something. Um, well, there is no beach. So that is one big attractant that uh, won't occur here. Um, the scent of other rats uh, that they may be interested in uh, mating with or uh, whatever, uh, whatever else rats do together. Uh, well, again, this, the, the cliffs may get in the way of um, creating a lot of enticing scents. So I think what we're likely to see is not impossible travel from the main island to this small island, but reduced travel. And I think that's what means, uh, that's what make, makes all the difference uh, between being able to see genetic differences between the two locations. So let's see how we actually examine genetic differences on a chart. Um, we call it a gene plot. And as I mentioned before, um, we can actually quantify how likely is it that each individual rat would come from the two different populations. And um, on the horizontal direction, what we get is a measure, a literal quantitative measure of how well the rat fits into the broken islands, the little ones. And on the other axis, we get a quantitative measure of how well the rat fits into the big island, the main, main island. And then it's just a question of plotting every rat and coloring it according to where it came from. So all of these red rats, they were caught before the eradication attempt. Very, very important. You must always uh, get your DNA samples before you complete your eradication, because once they've gone, they've gone, and you might need to know them. You, you, you might need them again in the future. So before the eradication, go out and collect lots of rat DNA. And that's what these red ones look like here. The blue rats, they all came from the big island across the water, main, main Great Barrier Island across the water. And what's actually amazing is that this is 300 meters. This is two rugby pitches, but we get major genetic differences. There's almost no overlap between those two colors, the red ones and the blue ones, which means that when we get those mysterious rats back in 2010, we should be able to conclude with absolute certainty which one of those two scenarios the new rats actually belong to. Are they belonging to the pre-eradication sample, in which case they are survivors, or are they belonging to the main Great Barrier Island population, in which case they're swimmers. So let's see where they actually lie. And you'll be able to get there before I do. You'll be able to figure out which ones are they, survivors or swimmers. And there we have it. They all group with the blue ones. They all group with the ones that uh, came from the main island. And that means, honestly, you don't hear a statistician saying this very often, but it means without a shadow of doubt, I can actually say this without a shadow of doubt, they are swimmers back from the main island. The reason I can say this, as those of you who are more technically inclined, is that this is actually a log scale. These yellow rats are tens of thousands to millions of times more likely to have arisen from the blue population than the red. It's an absolutely convincing, clear-cut conclusion. I would bet my life on it. So you might be saying, well, there's a couple of things that are surprising about this. Uh, so for one thing, uh, if there's no overlap, what's that rat uh, doing there? And honestly, I would bet my life on this one too. It's a swimmer in the reverse direction. 
So there's no particular reason that all rats should be desperate to go from a large island with lots of resources and diversity to a small island where everything's very confined. In fact, you would expect on the whole that migration would go in the opposite direction. And indeed, it often does. So um, we do indeed find rats that swim from the islands to uh, the, the bigger place across the water. And I'll wager that this is one of them. Um, one of the uh, pieces of collaborative, uh, corroborative evidence there is that although these blue rats come from all over Great Barrier Island, so it's a very wide, extensive area, this particular blue rat came from the part of Great Barrier Island directly opposite those little islands. So I'm pretty sure that that's what happened in that situation. And the other thing you might be wondering is, well, if there's such a big genetic divide, how come the rats got back so quickly anyway. And I think that all comes down to the cliffs. I think that because this is me speculating as a statistician, and um, I'd be very interested in other people have more, um, uh, more informed viewpoints than I do. But I think that um, the result of those cliffs is that rats don't swim across very often. And if you've got a population on the small island where resources are confined and they don't get imposters very often, they may well not accept them at all when they come. They may attack them or they may just not breed with them. We don't know what it is, but I think what we're probably seeing is rat sociology at play. And only when these um, incumbents were removed from those little islands, then the coast is clear and any new swimmers that come over from the blue population, they can actually survive and um, start a new population. So I think that's what we're seeing. This is why we have such a successful method uh, in part is because of rats keeping each other out from their own patch. So you must be thinking, does it always work? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Um, so going back to the Bay of Islands with those beautiful uh, flat, calm seas and beach crossings, we get an unholy genetic mess. So there's no genetic separation worth speaking of uh, in these, uh, uh, between these islands shown. And that's because it's just really easy swimming conditions. There's nothing stopping rats from swimming from one island to another. It was uh, Norway rats, the more eager swimmers that were um, involved in this uh, island population. And effectively, all of those islands are just like one giant uh, Norway rat population. Uh, again, that's 200 to 300 meter gaps, but it's dead easy if all you've got to negotiate is a flat sea and a beach. But nonetheless, even there, sometimes we do get lucky. And um, here's one rat that looks different from all of the other rats uh, that were ever caught in this area. This was uh, Bay of Islands again. What was with that rat? Well, it was found underneath somebody's tent. And so we're going back to the boating scenario. Uh, rats get to islands two different ways. They can swim or they can travel on boats. And this one genetically is unlike any other local rat. It almost certainly came on the boat tangled up in the camping gear of uh, the person whose tent it was found under. So that was a, an introduction about what we found out uh, from the rest of the country. And now I'm sure you're itching to know, what do we know about Waiheke? Um, there are two species of rats still on Waiheke. Um, so Norway rats, we've talked about a little, and these are um, characterized by being the most mobile of uh, the two European rat species. So um, they are keen and capable swimmers. 
And if that went bad enough, they often choose to live near people, near water and near marinas. They're not all that common and it's quite hard to actually find pockets of Norway rats um, on the mainland. But what's more is they're very hard to catch. And I think perhaps because they live near people, they're very, very suspicious of traps and devices. So it's really difficult to get um, uh, DNA samples or, or even just catch them um, uh, when what you're trying to do is eliminate Norway rats. And yet, despite all of that, despite the fact that they're not all that common, they are probably the greatest threat to islands out of the two rat species. And that's because they are very capable swimmers and because they like to live near water, near marinas, and they jump onto boats. And we've already seen how that can play out. So... How do you identify a Norway rat? Uh, so again, I'm not the expert, but this is the thing that I have found absolutely the most useful thing. I always look for one um, uh, clinching identification feature. And I think, as far as I know, this, this is it. This is what's worked for me, is that Norway rats have a pale underside to the tail. It's a little bit hard to see. I don't have a really good picture that shows it up easily. Um, because of the way the light is catching it, but it's very distinctive um, in practice. The uh, tail is pale coloured. People will tell you all sorts of other things about look at the shape of the head or look for whether the tail's shorter than the body and so on. But honestly, when you've got a squashed rat in a trap, it's pretty difficult to see what the shape of the head is. But the tail is usually intact. And so for me, that's the, um, uh, the, the trump card in the identification. Again, other people may have um, other ideas, uh, in which case do put it into the chat. I'd love to hear it. Um, We've already met the species several times today. Uh, it was the swimmer, it was the one that jumped off a boat in the Bay of Islands, and it was the one whose genetics was an unholy mess because it's such a mobile species. So going back to Waiheke and Surans, um, we have um, we have Waiheke here, and um, we have the most incredible collection of pest-free islands nearby, which is wonderful, absolutely wonderful, but it's not too far as the rat swims. How far is it? Let's have a look. So um, each of these green islands is a pest-free sanctuary, and as far as um, the ones on the west side go, uh, to get from Waiheke to uh, Motuihe, and from there to Motutapu, it's each of these lakes would be about, that's about 2.5 kilometers and that's about two kilometers. So it is possible. Um, we know for, for sure, for example, that um, rats have swum to the noise, Noises Islands, which are um, two kilometers away from anywhere, but um, it's at about what we think is the swimming limit for a Norway rat. So it's possible, but a little bit unlikely, I think, that rats would swim directly there. And if they want to go from uh, Waiheke to Mojutapu, it's five kilometers direct. Um, I don't know, I think that might be beyond the realms of plausibility, but I, um, I can't say for sure. So a bit of a gray area, it could happen, definitely. And on the east side, um, we've got two other history islands, Rotorua and Pakatoa. And um, Rotorua has been the focus of quite a lot of um, this work. And that's about 2.3 kilometers if you come from the Waiheke side, about 900 meters from Ponui. So as far as the Ponui crossing goes, it's definitely within capabilities. And then there were boats. The people of the Hauraki Gulf love to go out in boats and rats love to jump on boats and jump off at the destination. So we've definitely got a clear and present danger in terms of Norway rats and um, even ship rats getting around. What do we know about uh, Norway rats? 
in my heke. Well, actually, to be honest, we don't know nearly enough. And uh, I would love to get your help with this because we really need people to catch Norway rats and um, uh, from Waiheke and anywhere else in the Hauraki Gulf and send those um, rats for DNA analysis. Because what we really lack is good knowledge of the source populations. So Waiheke is a potential source populations to the pest tree islands of the Gulf. We don't have very many samples from Waiheke. In fact, we have just seven. And what's more, Ponoi is also a potential source island, and we only have one Norway rat sample in our entire database from Ponoi, which isn't nearly enough to keep a statistician um, uh, from having nightmares and not being able to sleep at night. So um, more samples would be wonderful, and uh, we need to do it now before eradications um, take place. However, Norway rats do often turn up on these neighboring pest tree islands. So we can actually do a little bit of statistical sleight of hand. We have lots of Norway rat DNA samples from rats that have turned up in unwanted places, especially Rotorua. So what we're actually going to do is a little bit of sleight of hand, and we're going to reverse match the source population to the population of invaders. I would never normally do this, but uh, desperation calls for it. This is what our genetic chart looks like, a very impoverished chart. We only have those seven rats from Waiheke. And uh, these two marked with a spot, uh, they uh, the only two that we had um, until about three years ago. Uh, so they come from about 2011, and these came from about 2018, I think. But we do have lots of Norway rats that have turned up on Rotorua in the past, 16, in fact, uh, that I have um, received genetics from between 2015 and 2019. So just doing that sleight of hand thing, we could reverse match and figure out where did those Rotorua rats come from? Did they come from Waiheke or did they come from Ponui? And what this boils down to is when we look at our one lonesome Ponui sample, where does it sit on the chart? So putting it in here and there it goes. Probably no surprise. What we've learned is that the Norway rats, that the Norway rats that have been found uh, on Rotorua, which is only about a 900 meter swim from Ponui, most probably they were sourced from Ponui and not from Waiheke. So that's good news. And it's also the log logical conclusion. What about Mototapu, Rangitoto rats? So um, over the years, since uh, 2011, um, one Norway rat turned up on Rangitoto in 2011, one turned up on Mototapu in 2018. Where did those two come from? Are we even expecting to see them anywhere on this chart or are they in the neither of the above category? Let's have a look. It looks like Waiheke is in the frame for these two rats. We can even distinguish, probably, according to the evidence in front of us, we can probably distinguish that it was Waiheke and not Pronari that um, those rats were sourced from that got to Mototapu Rangitoto. And that is not a short distance. Remember, it's five kilometers direct or uh, about two hops of two to two and a half kilometers if you go by Motuihe. So that is perhaps um, surprising. What it presumably means is that it's boat users. Um, boat users setting off from Waiheke and uh, the, the rats have got on the boat at Waiheke and got off at Mototapu. I expect that's what happened. 
So you must be wondering where else are Waiheke rats getting to? Are they getting to these other islands? There's Browns, Motoihe, uh, even Territory gets Norway rats popping up from time to time. If we're talking about boats, they're all in the frame. The answer to that question is nowhere. So out of all of the stray rats, uh, at least the ones that have come my way uh, with DNA samples from the last 10 years, precisely the two of them that turned up on Rangitoto and Mototapu were probably sourced from Waiheke. All the rest, territory invaders, Motorihe and Browns probably all came from Auckland mainland. So Waiheke is not in the frame for those. Doesn't mean that it won't be in the future, but uh, as history has played out, it seems like for some reason, uh, rats have made it twice from Waiheke to Rangitoto and Mototapu, but not elsewhere. What about shipwrights? So shipwrights are smaller, they're more numerous than Norway rats, very, very common. They are capable swimmers, but they're a lot less eager than Norway's. And they're most at home climbing in the forest. They're nest raiders. Um, my way of identifying shipwrights is by the long, uniformly colored tail. And it's longer than the body, but most importantly, it's the same color all the way around, that brown color, a long tail for climbing. And we've met the species several times already today. Um, it was the species uh, reinvading Kaipuku Sanctuary and the one that didn't swim uh, seemingly very often across to the cliffy place, but eventually did once the red rats had been cleared off that small island. So this is what we've known, what we've learned about ship rats so far today. What about in uh, the Waiheke uh, area and the Gulf? Do they uh, get far afield in this region? Not a lot, but occasionally. And one example where they did was uh, in Earth Passage, uh, where four of them turned up in 2013. And again, using genetics, we have reasonably good shipwreck samples uh, from uh, various places in the Hauraki Gulf, including Waiheke and uh, Ponui, and we did confirm that they were swimmers from Ponui, uh, which is a 350 metre crossing, so it's nothing to sniff at. Um, so that's all that I know about in terms of shipwrights moving around um, in the Gulf Islands. But it's not just about rats, and now we come on to New Zealand's most wanted, the worst predator out there, uh, the killing machine, which is the stoat. And um, what we have right at the moment is a plague, <laughs> a plague of stoats, um, three stoats perhaps, on Mototapu Rangitoto Islands. And they have been there since, uh, I think, early last year, early 2020, two rats have been turned up dead, but they're still finding stoke scat on the island. The last update I had was a month or two ago. As far as I know, they're still there. So Mojitapa and Rangitoto, history for the last 10 years, they're home to extraordinarily precious natives like Takahe, Saddleback Tieke, Kiwi and shore plover. And for the last two years, a very small number of very unwelcome stoats. So late 2020, two stoats turned up dead. Uh, so we know that those two, we've got the DNA samples from those two. We know they're dead and gone. But in February 2021, it's very likely that there were still two alive based on the droppings, um, the DNA that we can get from stoked droppings. It's very poor quality DNA, so our conclusions are very fudgy, but it's very likely that there were at least two 
And if those are still alive, they haven't been caught. So if neither of them has died naturally since February, then they're probably both still there. Um, at least one of them is still making droppings. Uh, my last update was about August this year. Incredibly usefully, they have all been males up to date. So all of the ones that we've got DNA from that we were able to identify the sex have been males. And that is such a relief because female stoats are pretty much always pregnant. So um, stoats have this unique reproductive system and baby female stoats, uh, when they're just nestlings, they're just tiny, tiny little kits in the nest. And adult male stoats will come along and they'll come visiting the nest, they will actually impregnate the baby female stoats. From that moment on, the baby stoat is pregnant and they have this incredibly uh, effective delayed implantation system. So when that baby stoat becomes uh, an adult female, implantation can actually take place and those um, eggs can implant and become um, embryos. So a female stoat can be on an island by herself and create a new stoat population. Uh, last I saw the cost of these um, three or four stoats on um, Mototapu Island had been $250,000 to date. Um, we've got the um, incredibly rare species, the shore plover, plover, uh, Tuturu, sorry, I tried to say this, Tuturu Atu, I think would be the pronunciation, Tuturu Atu. And um, there are only 250 of these birds in existence. So it's almost as rare as the kakapo. Uh, and Stokes killed three of them. 10 more were evacuated. You can start to see where this $250,000 is coming from. How do stoats get to Mototapu? We know where the Norway rats came from. The Norway rats came from Waiheke Island. But what about the stoats? Stoats are a totally different kettle of fish from rats. Stoats have enormous territories. They presumably swim larger distances. Their motivations, everything is going to be different from between stoats and rats. Where did our Mototapu stoats come from? So here's the gene chart. And what we've got here are Waiheke stoats in yellow. And mainland stoats ranging over a very wide distance from the Hunus to Tafaranui. So from way in the southeast of the Auckland region to way up north in the Auckland region, there's basically no genetic dis difference between the stoats from those places. And that's because they roam over such huge distances. But the island makes that break. So we can tell the difference between Waiheke stoats and mainland stoats, which means when we look at the Mototapu stoats, we will know which of those two locations did they come from, from Waiheke or from the mainland. So have a look. I'm sure you've all made a guess. And the answer is not Waiheke. Definitely not Waiheke. To be honest, they're not a wonderful genetic fit to either of the populations that we've got here. But one thing I can tell you for sure is they did not come from Waiheke. So that at least is uh, one sigh of relief. And this is not actually the first time that stoats have turned up on Mototapu. They um, happened in 2015 as well, just one, um, but it's the same pattern in 2015 as well. So all of the stoats that have ever turned up on Mototapu in uh, recent years, and I've also put 
Um, another population of stoats in, from the mainland that's um, out west in the white acaroos. And you can see there's basically very little to choose between all of these um, different mainland populations. Our Mototapu stoats are clearly not Waiheke, but this bothers me, to be honest. They do have some strange genes in their profile, and they're genes that we've never seen in any other stoats in all of our other samples. Is it just a little pocket of stoats somewhere on the mainland that we've never been able to get samples from? I don't know the answer to that question. But what we do think is that wherever it's coming from, not from you. Our best guess, and this is speculation, but um, this is a big um, area of farm, farmland um, that would be very suitable for stoat country. So I assume there are a lot of stoats in this area. We don't have samples from here. Our samples come from further down in the Hunuas. City rats, there probably isn't a population of, a, not a, a substantial population of stoats actually living in the city, but they're probably traveling. They're roaming around in the city, would be a guess. And so it's a guess, but I'm thinking perhaps they come from here, they roam around into the Eastern Bays, this area where there's mud flats, lots of juicy stuff to eat. And um, they could come through the Tamaki River, via Browns Island to Mototapu Island. But it seems most likely, we do need more, it's just speculation, uh, but it seems most likely that they're getting there under their own steam and um, from the mainland, somewhere on the mainland. So just wrapping up, um, it's time to prepare for a stoat-free future. I um, hear the wonderful news from Waiheke that your stoat numbers are way down. They are um, close to being uh, gone. And I would recommend collect some more DNA samples now. I promise you they will be needed in future. Um, I think it's very likely that sometime in the future you'll find a stoat on Waiheke again, you will want to know where it came from. Uh, so if you find a stoat, cut off the tail, put it in a bag, label it with the date and location as precisely as you can and freeze it. And then uh, let somebody know, uh, somebody from the Waiheke Collective or um, us here at the University of Auckland, let us know you've got it and we will um, find a way of um, getting that um, sample to a lab somewhere. And my, my uh, colleague Florian Buchenmuller has actually started a brand new study on um, the extent to which stoats are carrying and transmitting viral diseases. So this is um, a very topical um, question, what with COVID being transmitted from animals to humans. Uh, we want to know what sort of risk uh, do we have from stoats in terms of transmitting disease. And for this, he needs a particular type of DNA, which means he wants really fresh stoat catchers. Um, so he also needs the liver. So the best thing to do would be to take a whole stoat. If you have caught one that's not been dead more than a day, take the whole stoat, put it in a bag, freeze it as quickly as you can, and please uh, contact us somehow or other and uh, Florian would be very grateful because as you can imagine it's really difficult to get hold of very fresh stoat catchers. So that's what you're looking for, that black tip of the tail and the scat. And uh, with that I just have to say um, here are our conclusions uh, that Norway rats get to Mototapu by hitchhiking from Waiheke, it seems. Both Norway and ship rats can invade Rotorua sanctuary by swimming from Ponui and do, especially Norway's. Stoats, it seems, get to Mototapu from the mainland. And above all, history Waiheke is such an exciting project but it will not only make a beautiful island conservation sanctuary, 
it will also keep the other Gulf Islands safe. We can see even here in the picture, this picture is taken of Waiheke, and we can see how Rangitoto beckons to a um, swimming rat or stoat. So thank you very much. And um, uh, yeah, that's all I have to say tonight. Oh, kia ora, Rachel, and thank you so much. That was um, that was super informative. Um, I, I certainly um, learnt a lot from that. Um, we have had some questions come through uh, that I'd like to to ask you if that's okay. Sure. Um, so one of the ones that's come come through uh, is from Jesse, and Jesse is asking for rat samples. Uh, would you need the whole rat or just the tail? Just the tail. Um, so oh. yeah, absolutely. It's it's easy. It's quite clean. All you have to do is snip off the tail, and I would say um, the best thing to do is uh, to put it in a plastic bag and put it in a freezer. And um, as far as genetic samples go, um, more is better. Uh, sorry, less is better. Often, less is better. Um, you. The, the amount of tissue that they need in the lab is just tiny, tiny bit of tissue. So all we need is enough to make sure that we can make a clean cut uh, that's well away from contamination at the knife edge, that kind of thing. And um, so a section of rat tail, five centimeters of tail is absolutely adequate. What needs mm. more care is the label. So make sure it's yeah. got the date, the date and the location. That's um, uh, what needs the most care. And, and just get it to some sort of preservative quickly. So a freezer is fine. If you have ethanol, then that works, but um, I would recommend getting it to a, a sort of central collection location where they, um, uh, maybe they could, uh, maybe the collective could store ethanol century, centrally and um, uh, 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 collect samples from people uh, who've mm. frozen them. Mm. And I know Lisa's got a um, got a question as well, but just going going on from that, someone else um, has also asked: Can DNA samples come from mummified rats, or would they need to be uh, fresh, freshly caught rats? Um, believe it or not, they can. We we have even had mm. uh, mummified rats, but it's just much harder, and the chances are that it won't be a very complete DNA profile. So. I would say if it's a mummified rat, I would say it's only really worth it if it's uh, somewhere that it's really hard to get samples from. So if we can catch fresh rats, that would always be the preference. But if we can't get anything else, <laughs> a mummified rat is still better than, than nothing. And it's the yes. same with droppings as well. Droppings are very low quality DNA really hard to get good quality DNA out of it, but better than nothing. Okay. Rachel, um, where would people be able to um, get these uh, tails, <laughs> tails and, um, and or droppings to? Is that something that would be accepted too? by the university or would, um, is Te Korowe accepting, um, do you know, is Te Korowe accepting those um, samples? We've got a chat coming through from Jenny. Yes, Te Korowai Waiheke. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Okay. Awesome. Um, um, over to you, yeah, we, uh, Just see that we've had a question come through on our Facebook Live um, that, I'll, that I'll put to you. And um, so this is from uh, Maya. And uh, Maya is us saying, uh, Kia ora. Are you able to give us any insight in the possibility of the impacts of a marina meters from a regionally significant colony of little blue penguins and the impact on their population in regards to rats? Is it possible there could be an influx of rats or stoats from boats as stowaways or them potentially being attracted to the marina? Yes. So. Right. Yeah, I decide not to, yeah, um, yeah. I just thought I'd give you a little bit of context as to um, what I understand of probably why this question has come through is that we do have a marina 
being built um, in a very close proximity to a colony of little blue penguins. And, um, and so, yeah, um, so they're just asking what you, yeah, what you believe the, the impact would be or um, how would those rats kind of, what is the reason behind why they would be more um, common to see at a marina? Yeah, so I guess the question would be, um, um, are rats coming onto the island that way or um, is it uh, rats that are already on the island leaving um, through the marina? So if, um, if you were at a stage where Waiheke was almost pest free, almost rat free, then yes, the, the marinas are going to be a biosecurity risk. So um, rat trapping in the vicinity of the, of the marina and anywhere near um, uh, seabird nests, I think is a, a very good idea. Um, in terms of the rats that are already on Waiheke and why would they, um, why would they travel to the marina? It's, um, it just seems that Norway rats do favor um, locations near water and also near humans. And um, humans and water come together in marinas. It's, it's just very prime habitat for Norway rats. So um, yes, I, I would see it as perhaps a bit of an attractant. Um, I, I'm sure there are people who know a lot more about it than I do, uh, who are listening in and um, mm. uh, very happy if they make a comment. Mm. Awesome, thank you. Um, we, have a, we have a few more questions here for you. Um, Marcus is asking for how many generations does a rat population have to be isolated to develop distinct genetic traits that can be distinguished from other populations? Yeah, um, good question. Um, almost immediately. Uh, and the reason is, uh, if the population is um, created by just one or two swimmers, or even just half a dozen swimmers, it's their genetics that create the whole profile of the new population. And it isn't very long before they have interbred with each other, they've created a new population with their own uh, favorite uh, genes, and that population can then be um, distinguished from the ones on the mainland. And the reason is that um, the rats on the mainland will have far more gene, that their gene pool is just so much bigger. They've got so many more genes at their disposal that it's really unlikely. Like if, if you imagine uh, you and I, for example, wherever we come from in the world, we had the same genes available to make us, but we have different genes. And um, if I were to go off and start breeding with my close cousins and making a new population, it would only consist of my genes. It wouldn't consist of your genes at all. Um, whereas back in the, big, in the big population on the main island, you've got such a much greater diversity of genes. And that's what really enables us to distinguish because somebody that comes from a giant gene pool is gonna have a lot of genes that are unfamiliar in the very impoverished gene pool on the small island. So um, if the mechanism of uh, creating a new population on the island is that it was formed from just a few rats, almost immediately, it's gonna have its own genetic signature. Mm. Yeah, pretty powerful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, Adeline is asking, do you need more samples of Norway rats from, oh, where did it go? Kristen just, uh, sorry. Do you need more samples of Norway rats from the mainland? We definitely do. We'd love to have them mm. and stoats, Norway rats and stoats uh, from the mainland. Um, we would love, love to have them. Um, and uh, I can uh, give a context. Uh, yeah. Is, is the best thing to email me directly? Yeah. Um, yep. Yes, yes. Um, so you can, um, what we'll do is in our, in our, um, in our follow up to this webinar, we can share out that information for people who may be able to share samples of um, the Norway wet rats and stoats. Um, and get, to get your contact detail or wherever that should go um, out to the collective and people on this webinar. That's, that would be great. That's great. Thank you. Could, could I just say as well, um, 
if you're collecting Norway rats, because the idea is really quite tricky and even the experts slip up sometimes, but if you do collect the whole tail, then um, it will be able to use that pale underside trick and that might help because we don't want to spend a lot of money getting genetic samples um, that we think are Norways and then they turn out to be ship rats because we've got quite a lot of ship rats. So um, yes. uh, if, if you think it's a Norway, save the whole tail and then that might help the experts. Oh, and take a photo, definitely take a photo. Um, of the whole rat? Of, of the whole rat in the trap, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, Likewise, no, that makes with, sense. With stoats as well, take a photo and uh, mm -hmm. include it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. Um, we've got a couple of comments that have come through as well. One from Frank um, said, saying, all the stoats caught on Waiheke are frozen and sent to Andrew Veal for genetic analysis. Um, Julia, thank you for your talk and said it was very interesting. Um, somebody called Fizz and Fingers <laughs> um, has asked, what scents are most attractive to rats and how is this known? Um, gosh, I'm out of my league here. Um, I do know that, um, well, of course, in, um, in terms of trapping rats, people are trying all sorts of things, scented lures and um, uh, uh, stoat bedding even for attracting rats um for some reason I, I think it's a know your enemy thing sometimes rats are actually attracted to the scent of their own predators very strange um mm. i think i might have to hand over to hand over to better experts for that one but one thing i do know is that they um love macadamia nuts so um, <laughs> they have really classy tastes <laughs> to, to our rats. So if you happen to have, oh, and the other thing is um, Pix peanut butter. Not any old peanut butter. It has to be Pix peanut butter. Oh, that's really good to know, actually. Um, yeah. I think I have heard that before. I have a feeling they really like pumpkin seeds because um, at our Mata Kai at the Marae, um, there's only specific seeds that are consistently going missing. Um, and so, uh, yes, we, we, um, we've been noticing that, um, that our, they've given up on the peanut butter that we're using in our traps, so we may have to change that. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, we've got another um, question coming here from uh, Jenny from Te Korowai Waiheke, um, I think. Um, this, uh, she's saying, you mentioned that two kilometres was about the limit for Norway rats swimming. Have there been examples in other parts of New Zealand where they have swum longer distances than that to get to islands? Um, yeah, good question. I think I think the answer is non known, but of course it's always kind of difficult to know for sure that you've got a swimming rat. And mm. the reason that we know that that two point I think it was about two point one kilometer swim. Uh, to Motuhara Papa, which is um, one of the Noises Islands. And the reason that we know about that was because that rat was under active surveillance. So it had a radio tag on it. And it was mm. um, uh, the radio tag, it was untrackable. Uh, the um, a person trying to uh, track it couldn't find it anymore. And then after some weeks, uh, one of the very few inhabitants of Motohoropapa phoned up and said, I'm finding rat droppings on my rat-free island. And so that, that rat was really caught uh, red-handed, so to speak. Um, it turned out it was indeed his rat, his scientifically studied rat, that um, had swum that distance. Um, wow. In the north of New Zealand, it's more likely that you're going to get these longer swims. But um, I will say that we still have mysteries. Um, so there was um, an island in Fjordland, his name is escaping me just at the moment. Um, but just a month or so ago, um, uh, Doc was asking about this island, which is seemingly too far from anywhere um, to be uh, uh, likely to, to, to have had Norway rats swimming to it and yet Norway rats are there. Um, I, I'm not really buying the swimming explanation. Uh, the other explanation is that they've been there for hundreds of years, 200 mm. years. So um, both, both of the explanations seem to be 
very surprising, but we still get these mysteries that we can't actually um, resolve easily. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to respond to this. Um, it's quite a specific question that's come through uh, around hunting dogs. Why are hunting dogs not used to catch stoats on uh, I assume they, that was meant to say motutapu. Motutapu, um, yeah, they they are. Um, they are using so Doc is using every um, uh, every tool in its toolbox to try to catch these stoats, and um, dogs are most definitely uh, well up there. Uh, in fact, it's thanks to the dogs that we have the the scat, the the stoat droppings that we've been able to use to get the DNA out of them. It wasn't a human that went and sniffed out those droppings; it was a dog. Um, but it just goes to show the these uh, animals are really difficult to catch, even when you know it's there. Mm -hmm. You know, even more or less where it is, and you've got the most expert dogs uh, with you. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've got a, uh, thank you for that. We've got another question that's come through from Monica. Um, and the question is, uh, when doing genetic analysis, are you looking at color morphs in rats? Yeah, um, no, it's the quick answer, um, but um, it's, an, it's an interesting question. Um, so it's referring to the fact that um, ship rats come in three colors. I, I didn't actually, um, mentioned that ship rats are known as black rats because uh, you wouldn't really think it from uh, the picture if I uh, scroll back to some of these uh, pictures of ship rats. Um, it's not exactly very black <laughs> looking, but um, other, in other places in the world, they're often known as black rats. And the reason is because uh, they, they come in three different color morphs. One of them is black. I don't think I've ever even seen a black rat, a, a genuinely black ship rat. Um, the most common one in, in New Zealand is a sort of gray brownish one like this. And mm. then you also get gray brown with a really creamy, creamy colored front as well. Um, mm. But although these are genetic traits, um, they are rather unrelated to the sort of genetics that we look at. Um, the, the sort of genetics that we look at is purposefully genetics that doesn't really have any downstream consequence in terms of what the animal looks like or how it behaves and everything. It's sort of useless genes. And the reason is if you use useless genes, you can get lots of mutations building up and it won't do any harm to the animals. And so you get the most genetic diversity among useless genes rather than genes that actually do useful stuff. So um, I, I can be uh, actually quite definite that the sort of the, the, the specific genes that control the color of the rat's coats will not be the ones that we're looking at because we're looking at useless genes. Mm -hmm. oh, great, thank you for that. Um, I am just going to double check that we, yeah, I think uh, we have pretty much covered all of the, the questions there for this evening. Um, yeah, just absolutely fascinating. And I, I really loved how you uh, started that corridor with the tieki, with the, with the saddleback. And it's definitely a manu that I really appreciate seeing when I go, you know, over to Tiritiri Mātangi and into some of the outer islands and it's just so incredible um, when, when, when we see um, those manu that are so close, you know, they're, they're almost almost like they're within reach and, um, and such a special bird as well. I, I remember being told that that brown um, part on the back of it is part of the corridor about, um, you know, how about, about Maui and about um, how he brought uh, fire, fire to, to to us to us as um as humans and and the tiaki was singed in that process and that's why it has that coloring on its back um but it, it's yeah it's just just incredible and i think it really highlights the importance of all of this amazing work that's been done not only on waiyuki um but but by the likes of yourself and and so many people that are so dedicated to to our taonga species and 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 to making sure that um you know that the, that their populations are increased and and um, and the importance of us celebrating them and um, 
and it's just going to be super exciting when we're able to to see them see them more frequently so um just thank you so so much for for um for joining us this evening um, it's a real privilege to to have you as a speaker um for the festival um and yeah just just wanted to just yeah just say thank you and um and also hand it over to um lisa if lisa has um, anything else she would like thank to you add? So Hopefully, much. you haven't missed any of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that we've got them all there. We just have a few um, comments uh, saying um, superbly informative, Korero. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks to Lisa and Bianca for hosting. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks so much. Um, I think, yeah, lots of people just found it super, super interesting. I certainly did, even though I had to duck out and tell my children off right at the end there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um that's just all part and parcel of life at the moment isn't it um and thank yeah. you to everybody for making it along on thursday night and remember we've got um two more um talks coming up we've got um tree diseases and um next week and then the following thursday we have a talk on um information and data tools um, that are freely or cheaply available for community groups that are, are doing this kind of mahi so um keep an eye um on the waiheke collective um web page and plus we'll send you out all the links to those things so thank you everybody and thanks a huge thanks to you rachel and um, would you like to close this with a karakia bianca yes yeah absolutely um, and I'm not sure if you're aware, Rachel, but we were planning on having a festival festival, which is like a, it was going to be a big day of um, speakers and different workshops and so on. So we're still hoping that we can, we can obviously do that, um, maybe even early next year. So we would obviously, uh, we will definitely be extending that invitation out to you and it'd be wonderful to meet you in person over here on the island when um, COVID okay, and alert you. levels allow. Um, uh, Marida Himahi no iti nei kia, kia tātou, um, i hui hui mai ki te āta whakarongo ki tēnei, um, tēnei kaupapa nui nui. Um, uh, Marida tēnā tātou. Uh, unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapu nui, kia wātea, kia māma, te ngākau, te tīnana, te wairua i te ara takata. Koe ara e rongo whakiria ki runga ki a tīna, tīna, tīna. haumi e hui e tāheki e. Ko mari e. Thank you, Rachel. Ko mari e. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye-bye, Rachel. See you later. Bye. Ka kite.